Um, to begin with, Dave, I'm wondering what the uh, significance is of setting the film in San Francisco. Um, many critics thus far who've reviewed the film have made some interesting connections uh, to genre, film noir, um, as well as uh, the Asian American population of San Francisco and California. And I'm wondering if these two elements converge for you um, and how they come together stylistically in the production of the film itself. Well, um, I, I do have like a little bit of personal history with San Francisco. This is my third film that I've uh, that I directed there. But there's also, um, San Francisco is kind of a quintessential film noir city, like the Maltese Falcon and many other films have been set there. So it, it felt somehow appropriate um, to set the movie there. And besides that, it just, it just, it's one of those cities that no matter where you point the camera, there's always something interesting to look at. And um, it, it, at least on the surface, it's a very beautiful city. And it, and it felt like it matched the kind of movie, movie world that we were trying to create in the movie. Understood. Um, and I'm also wondering uh, about just the casting of uh, Kazuki Kitamura um, in uh, this somewhat friendly, eventually quite sinister role in the film. Um, so how you, Dave, came to uh, Kitamura's uh, attention, as well as for Kitamura-san, how you became interested in the, in the project and how this connection um, occurred. Well, for me, like the, require the biggest requirement of the role is since he disappears for a lot of the movie, um, we, needed, we needed somebody who has uh, the kind of charisma and the kind of memorability that you feel his presence even when he's not there. And uh, so for me, Kazuki really fit that, that description. And um, honestly, from, from the beginning, I, I, it, I didn't think it was really possible that he'd be able to do it. But luckily, um, the, the script came his way, and uh, he uh, was able to open up five or six days in a schedule of fly over to San Francisco and shoot the movie with us. And so it all worked out. Um, but we had a lot of fun working together. Great, thank you. じゃあ日本語でいいですかえっと、そういう感じで描かれてるのではなくてちゃんと人間として so the reason is, well, when I read this screenplay, the first reason is I felt that it was very interesting. And um, of course, I've been involved in a number of international projects, but um, in those projects, I tend to see j when Japanese um, actors perf perform in the role of a Japanese character, it tends to go by the way of caricature. But um, not in this film, I felt that the portrayal was very humanistic, and I liked that as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm also wondering about the portrayal of these characters um, in rendering of the script, script writing stage. Um, because as s some have noted, uh, the film almost features a kind of homme fatale in the place of a femme fatale character. And I think that's a very important decision in the, the story, story um, creation of the film. Um, and we also have interesting uh, mixtures of roles for our different cast members, um, particularly in the you know, female detective of Ayako Fujitani's character, um, as well as um, the Latino uh, sheriff who's very much representing a kind of American um, identity in the film. And in kind of rendering a film noir um, story in, in the script phase, I'm wondering how you conceived of this, of this day. Mm -hmm. Um, well, first of all, I, I did want to recognize one of my co-writers, Joel Clark, who's here in the audience, along with, oh, along with some of our, our other New York-based crew. Um, but Joel and I, when we first sat down to read the, uh, or to write the first draft, um, you know, it's funny, the, the homme fatale as opposed to the femme fatale, um, that idea didn't occur to me until I read that term in the uh, film festival catalog. But, 
Um, but we definitely did set out with the idea of taking um, the tropes of the mystery genre and changing them uh, both to fit kind of our own taste and what, you know, just what we would like to see in a mystery and also to kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of turn some of the cliches of the genre on their head a little bit. So, and um, but besides that, there's also about four years ago, I, or maybe it was three years ago at, the, at a New York screening of my last film, I was standing outside after the movie ended and um, somebody came out the doors and said, hey, good job. You really need to work on your female characters, though, and, they, and then they left. And, um, and you know, they were right. So I, uh, I, w I wanted to make, you know, I, I wanted to make a lead, a lead female character who was, uh, you know, very, very flawed, very human, and, but also some, somebody that was, you know, like a dynamic detective type of character, but still have it be grounded, not necessarily in reality, but, you know, a low-key type of... Uh, type of world that we tried to portray. Great. Um, and Kitamura-san, uh, as many viewers may see later today in Killers, as well as Neko Samurai, you're taking on very different roles and able to uh, portray both heroes in a kind of action comedy with Neko Samurai, as well as very sadistic, uh, yet uh, still undoubtedly, you know, protagonist roles in uh, Killers. And, you know, I'm wondering if anyone is advising against these decisions and these wonderful, wonderful uh, casting choices, or really how, how you approach uh, these really risky and I think brave uh, choices to take on these, these roles and how Man from Reno may fit into that. <laughs> so good. So, 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 so so yes, it's true that I tend to take on roles that nobody else wants to do, so it's a miracle that it doesn't have an adverse influence on my career. And I do take a lot of risks, and uh, some people do try to stop me, but I think that's a good thing in a way. I, it's not really my concern whether somebody likes me or not. It's really my most focus is that I do the performance that is uh, liked by the director and that satisfies the director. Okay, wonderful. Um, <laughs> In addition, um, I'm wondering about the experience of you know, producing the film on set. Um, you have uh, crew members and cast members from very different backgrounds. So I'm wondering about you know, the language spoken on set, um, any you know, cultural differences uh, encountered in producing the film. Um, and I also like to just com compliment the production and Morrison on you know, bringing together so many different uh, influences and forces into this uh, uh, really outstanding film that mixes together not only genre um, but different uh, industries across borders. Well, uh, Ko, Ko Mori, my my producer, is um, you know is I, I I have to I definitely give him a lot of credit for taking a, a risk on a, a film like this that is you know not exactly like a you know it's in two languages it's it's. Um, you know, it's a, it's a bicultural film, and it's not the, the kind of thing that's the e easiest, most obvious sell. And it's also a good time to point out some of the other, you know, it takes a village to make a film like this, but um, our, my associate producer, Carrie McCrowan, and co-producer, Alex Verba, and uh, Mai Hong, another associate producer, are all here tonight, as well as my production designer, Katie Porter, is responsible for everything that you see. <laughs> not to mention... Uh, I have, I have a lot of crew members in New York, uh, even though we shot in San Francisco. Um, my editor, Yasu Inoue, is here, as well as uh, Mari Ishida and Shunji Okada, who helped me translate the script and with the uh, Japanese editing of the Japanese scene. So it truly was like a, an international production, uh, as well as people coming together from all over the states to, to work on, on the film. Um, it's, it's funny uh, to see Yasu anyway, my editor here tonight, because we haven't seen each other in about three years, even though we spent the last year editing a film together, um, which I guess is a credit to the miracle of the, of the internet. Um, but, uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Oh, yeah, but, uh, well, I, I, th I think that, um, 
you know, I, I since most of the most of the, the crew are, were all Ameri are all American, I usually spoke um, English on set, and then just w when it, when it was needed, then we'd communicate in Japanese. But you know, since time is of the essence on any small project, then you just kind of go with whatever's whatever's needed, and uh, you know, try to keep the environment light and friendly along the way. I'd also like to ask uh, regarding another casting decision. Uh, decision. Of course, you have wonderful performances from Kitamura-san as well as Aiko Fujitani. Um, but you also have a great uh, third leading star in the film, Pepe Serna. And I'm wondering if you have anything to comment on Dave uh, in casting Serna, who's really known for his character acting um, and non-lead roles in such a big part. And I think it really paid off and he's you know, one of the, you know, three real draws performance-wise from the film, as well as Kitamura-san, if you have any uh, comments on acting with Serena-san. <laughs> oh, well, Pe I've, I've known Pepe for about nine years now, and when I made my, my very, very first film, um, he was kind of the only, not the only, but he was one of the, the, the minority of professional actors who came in to, to be in it. And uh, I was very impressed with him. It was, it was amazing to me that when, an, when somebody who's really professional and, and knows their job comes on set, everybody else who, m most of us working at the time were more of kind of film student level, um, everybody else raises their game to try to, try to meet that person's level. And um, we just always remain friends and I promised him after that shoot, someday I'm gonna write a lead role for you. And he was just kind of like, yeah, right, you know. Um, but uh, we kept in touch over the years, and you know I, I'd still see him in movies all the time. When I'm flipping through channels, he's usually the guy that comes in in one scene, and he, you know, plays like a big, colorful character for one scene, and then gets shot or <laughs> some, somehow. You know, he, he always talks about how he's been in a hundred movies and died in every single one of them. <laughs> um, so I always felt that he had the gravitas and the presence to be sort of a, a, a lead, you know, a main character in a movie. And I wanted to give him that opportunity. So it, it was funny to, to see him kind of change gears in a way because he's used to having to maximize every second of screen time. And so always coming up with, what if I, you know, what if I had, he, he's always got all kinds of ideas about how to make something more colorful. Um, and it was interesting to watch him kind of adjust to the idea that he could not do that much and just kind of be the emotional anchor of the story. Um, and so it was, it, we had a really great experience working together and, you know, I uh, hope to work with him again. Maybe, you know, maybe uh, in a supporting role and I can kill him in another movie. <laughs> そうですね、あの僕はあまりその情報が分からなかったんですけどあのただ昔なんだっけなアルパチーノとなんかスカーフェイス,スカーフェイスに出てるっていうことでおおと思ってちょっと上がりましたね。So him, Scarface, so、で,でも実際現場で会ってるとその撮影の合間に。すごく家の話とか絵の話とかずっとしゃべっずーっとしゃべってて撮影っていうことを忘れるぐらいにいろんな写真見せてもらっていろんな絵をそれが終わった時にはこの人がすごい俳優だとかっていうのを忘れるぐらいにもうなんかいろいろ写真を見せてくれるおじさんかなってぐらいな感じでも本当にそれぐらいリラックスさせてくれるぐらいにあの本当に優しく素敵な人でしたし一緒に仕事ができてあのやっぱりその周りの空気の作り方とかっていうかそのケアの仕方っていうことに関してはあのやっぱり人間が出てるっていうか役に対してあのやっぱり尊敬すべきだなと思いますしいいものを学ばせていただきました。So, of course, on set, um, in, between sh uh, sh in, in between shots, uh, it was very interesting because uh, Pepe would uh, show me his pictures, personal photos, and he would talk endlessly to me. So, by the time he got through all of his uh, personal photos, I'd forgotten completely that he was this great, respected actor. So, I um, mean, that's since he helped me relax very much. And I think he's a wonderful human being, and um, I think it really speaks to his character as a human and as a person that he was able to create and evoke this relaxing atmosphere for me. So, uh, it was a wonderful experience working with him. 
Well, we have uh, a full audience that I'm sure has many great questions uh, for our guests. Um, but before I open it up, I just want to ask, you know, what's, what's next? Uh, what projects are getting you um, excited for the future? Um, if there's anything, you know, working in the same mode as Man from Reno that you have in the pipeline. Yeah, I, I, I would like to keep working in the thriller genre. I'm working on a bunch of different stuff now, as well as um, my, uh, my day job is as an editor, so I'm also editing other people's films as well. And so I'm, uh, I'm not sure what's going to be next. I usually, I'm working on uh, six different scripts right now, and it's kind of a horse race. We'll see which one is ready to go and actually gets uh, some traction first. Great. <laughs> So you will call me for those projects, right? I, I'm, pro I'm probably sure that would be my next project, one of those. Yes, please. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so on that note, can we uh, open up uh, questions to the audience? We have one microphone traveling through the crowd. It looks like we have someone right here. <laughs> Actually, on that case, we have a very excited uh, question right here in the front row. Let's bring it down. <laughs> um, I just want oh, to if you could wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that he's my favorite Japanese actor, and I've followed his career for the last 10 years at least. So I'm very happy to see you in person. And I just wondered if you have any other projects outside of Japan, like in America or in another country, coming up. Ah, hi. Yes, I do. <laughs> I want to tell you, but so many of those I can't disclose any information yet, unfortunately. So we'll have to, we'll have to be left in suspense. <laughs> Which is good, which is good. Um, so do we have any further questions? I see a number of hands uh, right here. Right here in the blue shirt. I was just curious where uh, Kickstarter kicked in on your uh, financing. Was it the beginning, the middle, the end, or any comments you have about what role it played? Yeah, uh, Kickstarter was something that we planned on doing from the beginning, but um, it, it was something that we wanted to do for post-production when we had some footage to, to show. And I also want to mention that there's a lot of uh, there's there's a lot of our Kickstarter backers here tonight who are seeing the movie for the first time. You guys want to raise your hand so we can give you a round of applause? Yeah, thank you so much. So I think, I think for truly challenging movies, um, uh, truly commercially challenging movies, uh, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a great way to connect with your audience before the movie is necessarily done. People can look through Kickstarter and say, I like mysteries, I like thrillers, I like Kazuki, so I'd like to be a part of it. And, um, you know, and, and uh, I, since it was part of the plan from the beginning, then um, it allowed us to kind of develop the audience for the movie and a lot of those people are now getting to see it first uh, both at film festivals or, or, or wherever else so um, yeah it's, it's just part of the reality of being an indie filmmaker it's not something that I I necessarily feel I could do every time but I am extremely grateful to every single one of the almost 600 people who made the brought the movie to the finish line we, we the movie would not be uh, would not been, have been made without them Wonderful. Um, it looks like we have one more question right here. Hi, this is a question, I guess, for the writers. Or, uh, the, I was mystified at the end. How did the book, the last book, Melon Drop, get published under her name? I mean, the, the bad guy had the manuscript at the end. How did it get to the publisher? Why, did, why would he decide to publish it under her name? Well, there's, um, I think that the, logically if he just took the book and tried to publish it, an author who, somebody who's never written a book before and has no sales record would not be able to make any money off of it, so he kind of had to use her identity somehow. We wanted to establish that he's done this over and over, that he knows what he's doing. 
Um, we didn't want, I didn't want to do scenes of him hacking into her bank account or sitting at a computer or do, like, I just, I just kind of wanted to establish the, the, a, a general plausibility that something like this could happen if the person in question is someone who has a reputation like J.D. Salinger for never showing their face or for disappearing for long periods of time. So is it, a, is it a stretch in real life? Yes, absolutely. But this is also a movie that begins with a sheriff running over a guy in a car. At the, so it's, I feel that you know, the, the, the pleasures of the genre, uh, I, I hope, allow for some forgiveness for things that might not be real in the, in, might not be plausible in the real world. Um, and do we have another question, maybe from elsewhere in the crowd? Let's see. We have a hand right here on the edge. I just wondered how, uh, how long the process was from thinking up the idea to collaborating with your co-writers co to, to, you know, starting the film. Oh, well, it all started in 2010 when I had another project that was a, a gigantic detective story that took place in Osaka with an all-Japanese cast. And um, it was big, it was bad, it was epic, it was, it was huge. Um, and it was never going to happen, you know, so we, I tried really hard and, uh, yeah. So, um, but I, you know, when I met, uh, when I met Ko Mori, he suggested that maybe we could uh, do something set in the sta States that had a mix of Japanese and American culture in it. And uh, so that was sort of the, I had already had this idea for a movie where um, there are two storylines, one that was more emotional and one, one that was more like a traditional procedural mystery and then I we, Joel and I just kind of jumped on the, on that and started working on it and then um, you know about six months later we kind of had our footing where it was like okay we're gonna make this but then it was another six uh, you know it was it was over a year before we actually had it um, before the cameras which is remarkably quick for um, an independent film so it's I, I feel really lucky that we were able to put it together as, as quickly as we did the shoot itself was um, a, about 25 days and split up among uh, several different cities, which is always really, really hard on a crew. So uh, I really, uh, you know, that's one of those things that I'll be grateful to everybody who worked on that shoot for the rest of my life. Great. So we have uh, time for one more question from the audience, and then we should break. I see a hand here on that side. Could we pass the microphone down the row? Um, I was curious because uh, you mentioned working with translators uh, for the Japanese uh, for the Japanese dialogue, and I was wondering what your facility with Japanese was because I was curious how you know it's, it, dialogue is such a tricky thing, and how you kind of hand over a major part of you know the nuance and stuff to the script to someone else, and how you know kind of how you know they're getting it right, um, and, and what that process was like. Well, as, as um, Kazuki mentioned, when, whenever you're dealing with uh, like a script that's not written by a native speaker of the language that it takes place in, there's always sort of a learning curve. So, um, you know, at first I, I had, we did several different rounds of translation, um, and, uh, but it still kind of had this feeling that what Joel, Joel and I and, and Mike, the third co-writer, had written was sort of being directly translated into, into Japanese. Um, Oh, and my, my Japanese is okay. It's, I'm, not, I'm not perfect, I'm not like, you know, but uh, it's mm. g good enough to, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Jose, Jose. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, but then uh, like the third component of it was really kind of just everybody talking about it. Um, I mean, when Kazuki arrived in San Francisco, we spent in an, almost two whole days just sitting in a conference room going over the script. And before he arrived, I spent a couple of days with Ayako, the, the, the lead, going over the entire script. Not, not even just, uh, just her lines or anything. She kind of became like uh, another translator in a way. Um, so I think that just you, you kind of have to, to make sure that you're, you, you can't always just write a scene in English and then translate it into Japanese and have it be a, a workable scene. Sometimes you have to figure out what the goals of the scene are and create a new scene that achieves those goals or, or something that is 
so, so in the end, I, I definitely got what I wanted, what, what, uh, what Joel and I were kind of picturing when we wrote it, but it also had sort of a new flavor that was added by the contributions of Kazuki and Ayako, as well as all the other translators who helped us out, as well as the producers, so. Great. Uh, so, thank you so much. Um, we should uh, wrap wrap up the screening so we can get Neko Samurai started. It'll be screening at 7:30. Um, so, thank you so much uh, for our guests. Thank you. Thank you.